It was a clear day, but Jane had heard there was rain in the forecast for the evening. That's why she was extra impatient to get home. No one likes driving home in the rain, especially at rush hour. Was that this morning she had heard there was supposed to be rain? Was she just completely imagining that? It didn't matter. Another reason to get home quicker didn't affect her all that much. Just add it to the pile. Jane suddenly remembered she had to pay the after-school babysitter, and he'd be there watching Cynthia and Thomas when she got home. Did she remember to pick up cash? Her mind raced backwards from her drive home, and after a moment she was able to recall that she did, in fact, pick up cash yesterday on her lunch break. When she snapped out of her mini panic attack, Jane was breathing quickly, so she focused for a moment and took a few deep breaths. In through the nose, out through the mouth, just like her therapist told her. Enough with the negative thoughts, she said to herself, let's drown them out, and she turned up the car radio. Jane was glad to have her therapist appointment tomorrow. It was nice to be able to actually take time out of her week to talk about how she was doing, how she was feeling. She already knew she was going to talk about work mostly. Taking on a more involved role with more hours was good for her career and income, but Jane was getting less and less sure it was good for her mental health. There was nothing her therapist could do about that, though. It's not like she had the option to work less anymore. Thomas, Cynthia, and her needed the money now that Joshua's life insurance ran out. Jane's mind almost faded to white for a moment after she thought of Joshua. What she wouldn't give to have him waiting for her at home with the kids instead of the sitter. She might not even need a therapist if he was still around. He was always the one that she could talk to about anything, always managed to give her the right advice, be patient with her no matter what she was going through. It didn't matter what she came to him with, he looked her in the eyes with love. From a bad day at work, too. Jane knew that wasn't going to happen anymore, and that her therapist was the only one she could talk to now. Jane realized the radio station she was listening to was playing commercials now. Even after turning the volume up, she totally forgot it was even on, so she just turned it off. As she pulled off the freeway, Jane's mind shifted back towards her appointment tomorrow, and she went over a list in her head. The list of topics she decided she spent too much time on already at therapy. Topics even the therapist wanted to move past at this point. 1. Joshua and his death. 2. Her fear of not being able to raise her children on her own. 3. Her fear she will slip back into some old, bad habits as a response to stress, her history of self-destructive behavior in her younger days, how she used to have mental breakdowns. That hadn't happened in years and years, though. Jane's mind faded to white again for just a moment before she realized she was about to miss a veer in the road and drive up someone's front lawn. She made the turn just before her front tires hit the curb, and thought to herself she was lucky there wasn't a car parked there. In fact, Jane noted there didn't seem to be any cars on the road at all, even though she was on a residential street now. The hairs on the back of her neck stood on end, and she started to look around the neighborhood from house to house as she drove, looking for any signs of life at all. For over a block, she didn't see as much as a curtain sway or a shadow pass by a window. She didn't even hear so much as the distant shouts of kids playing. Suddenly, her head snapped forward as she slammed on the brakes as her eyes went wide. Standing in the middle of the street was the first person Jane had seen in. She didn't even know how long. They were just standing there, perfectly still, as if cut out of the frame of a picture or they were part of a movie that was paused. This particular character was paused looking straight at her as if they knew that was exactly where Jane was going to stop. And maybe they did. Because as far as Jane could tell, she was looking at herself. Same clothes, same haircut, same makeup. Then Jane truly took in this figure's face, cast in shadow though the angles didn't make sense, and almost flinched at what she saw. That's not me, Jane mumbled to herself. That's some twisted caricature of me, with a look that only conveyed hate, disgust, and a morbid sense of delight, she thought. Jane's breathing sped up again, but this time she was unable to stop herself. Her mind was completely taken up with trying to process the situation. Before Jane could manage, however, the twisted double started to run at her car. The double was moving in an almost mechanical way that implied it didn't understand how to control its own body, but at the same time it was moving with supernatural speed. As adrenaline snapped her out of her shock, Jane put the car in reverse and floored the gas pedal. Instead of rocketing backwards, the car's tires spun in place for a moment, just long enough for the double to reach the driver's side door. With a force that almost tore the door from its hinges, the double threw it open and pulled Jane out of the car, tossing her to the asphalt. Before she could stand up, the double was upon her again, looking down with that same twisted expression. Jane froze out of fear for just a moment as their eyes met. In that moment, the double's eyes widened, 
and a smile slid across its face, just before it started kicking Jane in the stomach and ribs. To Jane, each impact felt like it was coming from a sledgehammer, hammering away at her torso five times a second, struggling to even breathe between the impacts compressing her lungs and feeling as if her ribs were about to break, Jane was barely holding on to remain conscious, and just before she felt she was about to slip away, the pounding stopped. Immediately, Jane gasped for air as her vision started to clear up. She saw the double walking away and into her car. As the double got into the driver's seat, their eyes met again, and again, Jane saw nothing but hate, disgust, and a morbid sense of delight. Suddenly, a shrill squeal pierced the silence straight into Jane's ears like a needle. Her eyes had shut out of reflex, but fear forced them open again just in time for her to see the car fishtailing towards her, rear tires screaming. Once again, Jane found herself on the ground with her double almost upon her, but this time, her double was bearing down with the weight of a car. To Jane, it felt like the weight of the world, not just as the car came ever closer with clear, malicious intent, but when the front right tire rolled over her ankles. She was unaware how long she laid there, screaming, trying to move her feet, but when she finally stopped, she noticed it was darker out. The sun was setting. With adrenaline coursing through every inch of her vascular system, Jane couldn't stop her mind from running a mile a minute. At first, her thoughts were a barrage of questions. Who was that woman? Where did she come from? Where is everyone? Where was she racing off to? Then a thought hit Jane as hard as her own car just had. Jane snapped her head towards where she had initially stopped the car. The tire marks in the asphalt confirmed what she somehow already knew. The car hadn't turned around. When the double got in the car, she kept going right to her house and her children. Jane didn't know what made her so certain of that, but she was so sure a questioning thought never entered her mind. The second she realized it, she began to pull herself along the asphalt, one arm over the other, without a second's hesitation. As the edge wore off the adrenaline, she became increasingly aware of the pain again. She didn't want to even look at her ankles for fear of being unable to stop herself from vomiting. That'd be a waste of time. Not that she was getting anywhere fast, but she still hadn't seen anyone, and her pleas got no response. She could feel every single jagged piece of asphalt she had to crawl over stab into her body, every broken piece of her ankle bones shifting. The only way she could keep herself together was to keep moving forward towards home. Pulling herself along the gravelly street all alone, she felt like she was in an oarless rowboat, adrift in an asphalt sea. Despite her efforts to stay focused, Jane's mind returned again and again to grisly visions and the fear of what this woman, no, creature, wanted with her home, her kids. Thomas, if you're safe when I get home, you can try and eat your soup with any utensil you want and I won't get mad, I promise, Jane told herself to try and help block out a vision of the creature throwing boiling soup at his face while he's tied to a chair, screaming out his fear and confusion while the creature mocks him. Cynthia, if you're happy and smiling when I get home, you can take as long of a bath as you want. I'll even let you fill the tub up again with fresh, hot water when it gets cold. Again, Jane attempted to suppress a suddenly dark imagination, this time picturing the creature holding Cynthia's head underwater in the tub while shouting, How long do you want to stay in there now? Her visions bounced around like a fever dream, the creature thrashing the family photos adorned on the walls, yelling something at the babysitter about telling his dad to stop looking at her like that before throwing him down some stairs. With every step the creature took through Jane's house, towards her children, the house shook. Pictures fell off the refrigerator, participation trophies and vacation tchotchkes were sent from their places of remembrance to the increasingly soiled floor. However. The truth of this creature's monstrosity was most evident in her face as the rampage continued. Her face was no longer the same mix of hate, disgust, and delight. There was something new, a macabre sense of relaxation, of relief. It was as if those depraved acts of unbridled cruelty were deserved all around, and that by doing this the creature was somehow making something right with the world, or at least their world. And with every bit of destruction she laid on the artifacts of Jane's happy memories, every mocking word yelled at her children, it was as if a crushing weight was being lifted from this creature's hateful shoulders. The creature celebrated her newfound lightness by dancing like some insane ballerina in front of Jane's crying kids. Finally, after what felt like years of painful dragging and mental anguish, Jane was now pulling herself along her own street. However, any excitement she may have felt for a moment was gone 
when she realized the car was haphazardly parked in the driveway, with two windows rolled down and the parking lights still on. Jane's body found another reserve of adrenaline as she began to frantically put one arm in front of the other, lips now trembling and her eyes welling up. Once again she thought to call for help, but once again she saw, and felt, that she was entirely alone out there. As she somehow managed to pull herself up the steps and through the threshold of her front door, she felt like she just walked into a nightmare made manifest in the real world. The house was trashed, and Jane didn't see or hear any signs of Cynthia and Thomas. As her mind faded from the reality in front of her, unable to mentally process what was going on anymore, she couldn't tell what made those marks on the wall, whether it was blood, marinara, or even minestrone. She started making her way to the kids' room, her eyes scanning more and more evidence of violence and carnage. She noticed the door to the basement was open. In fact, it looked as if it was busted open from this side. The stairs down to the basement looked damaged, and as if they might have blood on them. But for some reason, Jane didn't stop. Somehow she knew she wouldn't find the answers she was looking for down there. Somehow, some way, it was as if the creature had filmed herself destroying Jane's life and had the feed transmitted directly into her brain. Finally, Jane saw the doorway to the children's bedroom. She was so single-minded to see the state of her children she didn't even notice the carpet outside the bathroom was soaking wet, or that she didn't feel a thing as she dragged her ankles over the raised threshold of the room. Despite her panic, Jane was unable to call out to her children, as if a ghost had reached into her throat and was holding her vocal cords still. She noticed a lump of clothing in each bed, and the edges of her vision started to blur as the pounding of her own heart in her chest drowned out all other sound and thought. Then, without hesitation or contemplation, she stood up. Jane swayed and wobbled like a dried-up dandelion in the wind as she got to her feet. It took a moment for her to actually take in the scene, her tunnel vision now being pushed to the extreme, as if her subconscious was trying to close her mind's eye if it couldn't close her physical ones. Even still, it only took a moment for her deepest fears to be confirmed. Jane's eyes started to roll to the back of her head, and the momentum sent her stumbling backwards. She continued until the top of her upturned head smashed the glass of the standing mirror on the far wall. She just stopped there, frozen like a statue as her mind tried and failed to understand the events of the night. She didn't even notice the glass shards pinned between the mirror back and her skull that had stabbed into her scalp. The instant Jane regained control of her body, she collapsed. It was almost a minute before she even realized she was screaming. In her denial, she told herself that there must still be something that could be done, she just needed help. That thought carried her once again to her feet and towards the front door like a woman-shaped automaton. The night air brought Jane to her senses just enough to notice the sets of lights, sending out spinning beams of red and blue that hit her like spotlights. Then, she saw a group of people in dark clothing rush up to her. The first one, a tall woman, grabbed Jane by the shoulders and said something to her, but the only response Jane could muster was an incoherent and near-silent mumble. After a moment, the tall woman gently moved Jane to the side and the other people in the group rushed into the house. The tall woman stayed outside with Jane, one of her hands constantly on Jane's shoulder. A few exceedingly long minutes later, the rest of the group of darkly dressed people came back out of the house. After a moment of the group exchanging words, the tall woman helped Jane to her feet, pulled her arms behind her back, and put her in a pair of handcuffs. As Jane was walked towards the line of cars in the street, she saw something that caused her head to snap up from the limp position it had been in. Just over the bars of flashing lights, Jane saw people. Lots of people. All standing out on their front lawns and looking at her. Horrified. 